We're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Word Nerd Chat Q and A uh, Hawaii shirt edition. <laughs> so I've never been this it's, happy in my life. This is not my fault. I would say that. Right off the bat, I was coerced. We, we blame old yeah. John. <laughs> um, so, what else is joining us today? Apparently. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you everybody who has tuned in. We are going to be doing a live Q&A today. Uh, all things about publishing, writing, um, like literally anything. It's just labeled Q&A so you can ask us really anything that crosses your mind and we're happy to answer if we can. I do have a few questions to start us off with. Um, some kind of like easier one and then a fun kind of spicier one um, to get things started. So I will, I will, because uh, I think Rachel tuned in a little bit after I told you guys what this one was. So the, oh, the, surprise. the, the third question I'm going to ask, so keep this in mind, is you have to fight one character and you have to fight with one character. Oh, cool. So sort of mull that over. Uh, well, we ask the easier questions here okay. and, and feel free to leave answers to the like the kind of fun ones in the comments as well if you're tuning in now. So one character you have to fight, let's say to the death, just to keep things spicy and one character you have to fight with, like alongside, sorry, I should say. Okay, so the easy ones are like, do you guys have any writing rituals that you cannot do without? Mine is just like a cup of tea. And I used to be like fastidious. I'm like, I have to have a candle. I have to light a candle when I start. And that was like the signal to my brain start. Don't do that anymore. Just a cup of tea. So how about you guys? Anyone jump in? Um, I think I prefer to be outside of my house for doing it. Like even mm. if it's just in my car, since I can't really write in coffee shops right now. Um, other than like even including that there's nothing that I feel like I really have to have to do. I prefer to be typing rather than handwriting. Um, if I was really desperate, I would handwrite. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything that's a, an absolute must anymore. What about uh, silence or music? Do you have to have it a certain way or are you just good to go whenever? I'm good to go. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> I have to have like some, if there's noise going on, I have to have, like, I have constructions ne <laughs> construction next to my house. <laughs> He's so cute. I have construction <laughs> next to my house, and I have to have something in my headphones, or, like, um, every little noise will annoy me. Mm -hmm. um, like, somebody was drilling next door, and I was like, it feels like that's directly happening in my skull um, mm -hmm. if I don't have headphones on, so... If, yeah, if I'm, if I'm somewhere noisy, especially if there's like conversation going on, like if I'm in a coffee mm. shop and there's people like really close to me having a loud conversation, then I like need to have something. But otherwise, it just kind of like depends on the day. Yeah. There's nothing, yeah, same. There's like nothing specific that I like need to have. Like I like to have a cup of tea mm -hmm. or, or like either tea or coffee, especially if I'm writing in the mornings, but I'm not super picky about it. Mm hmm. My ritual is almost a lack of ritual. Like I do better by mixing it up every time like writing in a different place, maybe on my computer, maybe just on my phone, or I don't really write by hand, but like brainstorming by hand in different places makes a huge difference. Like I can stop going at my desk and move to my kitchen table and just get a whole new burst. That's a very good trait to have. Very mm -hmm. jealous. Mm -hmm. Rachel, any rituals or just like even preferences you have, like a certain spot or certain music or no music or? I'm sorry, all my brain power is going to like, who would I fight? <laughs> <laughs> That's I was fair. not prepared for this. Um, I don't really think I have any, any rituals besides getting tea, but I do that for everything. So I'm not sure if that's like a writer specific that's thing. everything ritual. <laughs> truly, like whenever I'm about to start a task, I'm like tea yeah, and then same. you know, and then that's that's it. No, I don't, I don't really have a, a preference. I mean, I like going to coffee shops because then I know that I don't have like Wi-Fi or easily accessible distractions next to me. But yeah, like I'll write at my desk or in my bed and that's fine too. So pro probably just tea. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also, like Megan and Rachel said, a huge coffee shop writer. Um, so this COVID thing has been 
a little rough. Um, some of the coffee shops are open, um, but it's mostly patio writing. And I'm not someone who can write by hand unless I'm uh, just taking like draft notes. Um, so, you know, when you write outside and it's like, oh, the glare off my laptop, I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not really even an option at this point. So I definitely like, I feel like I'm really heavily having to readjust things and like relearn how to write at home and not just like go watch Lucifer for five hours or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. did take Megan's advice and I worked like in the car today. It was partly because my baby had fallen asleep and I was like, I'm just going to let him sleep. <laughs> He's asleep in the car seat. We're staying in the car. But I like stayed in the car and like wrote in there. And I was like, okay, this is kind of nice. It's, I mean, it's not the same as being in a coffee shop, but at least I wasn't at home with like a million other things that I feel like I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to feel much more particular. I think it was more when I was writing for a lot longer every day. Cause right now it's like, I'm lucky if I get an hour to write each day. Um, but then towards the tail end of when I was writing for significant chunks of the day, I I did this experiment <laughs> to see like, well, how much of this is in my head? And I ended up getting like the same word counts with every ritual that I tried beforehand. And then I was like, oh, this, <laughs> you have made this up. <laughs> Uh, hello to Kaylin. Um, our question was, if you have any rituals um, that you like to do, like get a cup of tea or be at a certain spot or have music or not have music um, before you get started with your writing. Definitely a can of diet soda and a snack of any choice. Um, right now, my snack of choice is Cheez-Its, which mm -hmm. I always kind of go back to. Um, I just started uh, like kind of listening to my playlist again. I had it buried on Spotify because we have like a 50 playlist because we share it as a family. And I randomly found it and I started adding songs to it. And my mom introduced me to a song. Um, it was the uh, person who left Pentatonix. He did a solo career. And one of his songs good. was <laughs> so good. Oh my gosh. And it just gave me all these vibes. And I'm like, this is definitely something that I need to add to my playlist. And I saw somebody tweet out today. They were like, hey, just to let you know, listen to your playlist, add more music to your playlist and say goodbye to writer's block. And I was like, that literally just happened to me this week. It was so weird. <laughs> so definitely music, but not while I'm actually writing, because mm -hmm. if it has words, I will sing it and I will mm -hmm. not write. Um, but definitely drinks, snacks and quiet is what I need. One of the things I've noticed is because sometimes I really like music and then sometimes it is so distracting. But one of the things that I do for me that I don't know why it works, but sometimes it does is if I am getting really stuck on a scene, um, I usually have a song that I already really enjoy that I feel like encapsulates like this character or whatever, because I make playlists pretty early on. And I'll take like that song and just put it on repeat until like I've heard it so much that it just all the words blur out. It's just the vibe. <laughs> and um, that definitely helps dislodge some words. Oh, so shout out to uh, N. Griswold, who's here with us in the comments. <laughs> Let us know if any of the rest of you are here. Let us know what your process is, because definitely no one's process is the same. Mm -hmm. And Griswold said, I like to have headphones and a notebook. I can write random thoughts slash things to look up later in so I don't get distracted and can keep writing. That's and smart. And this is an open Q&A. So again, if you're tuned in and you're not sure, you can ask us anything about writing or the publishing process or anything you may want to know. Um, or, you know, books. We are always have to recommend books if you're looking for a good read. Um, so the, our next question, which I will warn Kaylin about in advance, you can be last so you have time to think about this. <laughs> Rachel's really been like, I've been thinking the whole time. I can't think about anything else right now. I'm ready. I'm so <laughs> ready. <laughs> so you have one character that you have to fight to the death. And you have one character that you have to fight with. So you team up with them to take on this other person. Possibly they have help. I don't know. We'll figure out how fair it is. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can go last. So you have a bit, little bit of time to think about that. And it can be a character from any book, any movie, any TV show. We're keeping it broad. So it's not like okay. too hard to choose. Megan looks like you look ready to have something. Okay. Nice. okay. 
I want to fight Twilight Bella Swan to the <laughs> not freaking Swan, like not Vampire Bella. I know I can't handle that. But <laughs> Twilight oh, Bella. <laughs> She's gonna trip on something and just like impale herself, and you're like, "Well, exactly." Mm-hmm. I want opening of the series, Bella, <laughs> uh, and I want to do the fighting with Gideon from Gideon the Night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're just gonna sit back in a lawn chair and watch. <laughs> and that's what Gideon would want me to do. So. Right. <laughs> Mine's even worse because I just looked at like my 2020 books that I read. Otherwise, there was just too many, so I went with Gideon as well. But I wanted to fight like old lady Sophie from House of the Castle. <laughs> oh, so, oh, right. <laughs> Why are you killing off these nice characters? You want us to kill somebody. I want to be my There are villains too, you guys. There's a murder me. Bella and <laughs> I can't the villains. They're all too powerful. <laughs> I like how we're we're just choosing people that we know we could be. <laughs> oh, yeah, people we want to fight. The weak, the weak version of because my answer is a weak person. <laughs> survival of your answer, Emma. <laughs> All right, Emma, what's your answer? Uh, I'm gonna fight Jason from The Good Place. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he is so soft, oh, no. and I can beat him. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> he has his like 46 person dance crew no with it's him. just him it's not his dance just him because I have to depend like Janet can't be there because I feel like Janet could beat me up he would definitely just Jason, Janet would wreck you Jason is soft <laughs> I could beat him up he <laughs> wouldn't know what was coming <laughs> Yeah. So I'm going to fight with yeah. I'm going to fight with Ede from the Priory of the Orange Tree oh mm-hmm. good choice mm-hmm. yes all right, Rachel, do you have anyone yet? I do. Okay, so I want to fight America Singer from the selection. <laughs> because she's so annoying. And I feel like if I beat her to the death, I am also a redhead, so I could just take her place. And no one will be on the other wider. Mm-hmm. And suddenly they'd be like, wow, America, you're like so smart now. And I could just like seamlessly integrate into that society. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if I wanted to fight with somebody, I would fight with Helene from An Ember in the Ashes because mm-hmm. I know Good. she would have my back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. So before Kaylin has to give hers, Erin, who were you like so nobly choosing to take yeah. on? The <laughs> <of> the <world>? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to choose James from Twilight because I literally hate his stupid face. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was going to team up with Bella, or not Bella. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna team up with um, Buffy, so I can like sit back in my lawn chair and just sit my tea and watch. Yeah. Did you specifically choose Buffy the Vampire Slayer to fight James? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. (laughs) Good combination. Cashed it out. I'm just out. (laughs) So I'm a lover, not a fighter. So I have no Mm. idea who I would fight to the death. I know I would fight with Castiel because I feel like he's got a one-up on pretty much anybody. Sure. <laughs> but I honestly, I don't know who I would fight. Who would I fight? <laughs> like it's like Make a hard choice happy because I know I would really leave. Evil. Mm-hmm. But Castiel will do all the work. It's pretty much how we all the rest That's of That's true. So. Yeah. I feel like evil and wouldn't be too hard to beat up would be Umbridge. You could beat her up. Mm, yes. Yeah. That's satisfying. Cass yeah. could just be like, sm- what, smote? Smite? What's the smote? What's like the past <laughs> <laughs> of smite? Smite. 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 Yeah, I would go with Umbridge. I like that one. Me and Cassie, yeah. could take her down. Mm-hmm. That would be extremely satisfying, I feel yes. like. Um, yeah, that's a good answer. Just because she um, moved, I just want to make sure everyone notices the dog yes. <laughs> in her matching shirts. <laughs> also has a Hawaii shirt. Adorable. <laughs> the same shirt that Megan and I have, just a different size. Uh, Kaylin, don't worry. I was not notified of this either. I just ran to my closet and was shocked that I had I nothing. have nothing Hawaiian, even remotely Hawaiian. <laughs> actually Hawaiian. I looked too. Like I, I dug through parts of my closet that I haven't seen since March oh, because no. I don't have to wear work clothes. So I have nothing Hawaiian. Nothing. Yeah. Well, this shirt that Megan Kelly and I are wearing is from Old Navy. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. It's cute. Yeah. If you get the pink one, you can dress like Isabel from Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not pretty exciting. 
Mm -hmm. uh, by Ellie M says, I like having background noise like a movie or TV show. I've seen enough that I'm not tempted to look up and watch. I definitely do that with community and the office. Mm -hmm. I'll put that on in the background. The office 100%. Yep. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. one season of the Great British Bake Off that I've seen enough times <laughs> that I can like put it on and it's a comfort. <laughs> Just I can put on like, like I can't put on something like I really, really love. Like even like I couldn't watch, even though I watched Parks and Rec like three times already, I couldn't put it on while I write because I'd want to watch it again because I enjoy mm -hmm. it so much. But mm -hmm. I have worked to things like House Hunters where it's like, I don't care that much, but I can look up every once in a while and see like yeah. the cool houses or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do the same with, um, there's this really awful show that for some reason I, I bought a season of it because I was going to write this like, tornado witches book but i never got around to it but um it's like tornado hunters or storm mm. hunters or something there's like there's, oh, yeah my in-laws yeah. were watching that the last time they came to visit yeah and it's boring enough that i can just have it on in the background and occasionally be like cool tornado lightning and mm -hmm. then just go back to whatever i'm doing because it really is really boring Wait, like there's no so, okay hunters? i feel yeah. personally attacked i just need to say that <laughs> <laughs> so we have this issue in my house that at nighttime, my husband just likes to filter through YouTube mm -hmm. and sometimes he'll throw on like a documentary and I'm like, oh, that's fine. I can walk away from that and do what I need to do. Like literally a month ago, he put on like somehow the algorithm got a hold of all of those storm chaser TV shows from the weather channel. And it was specifically like tornado stuff. And I got so sucked in. I watched four episodes in a row and I realized, oh my God, it's one o'clock in the morning. I need to go to bed. <laughs> and, and not I get there. so sucked in. <laughs> but <I'm>... uh, <laughs> I just got it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's been a weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. For some reason, to me, it was like, <laughs> oh, they're in the truck again, and they're complaining that they that they're in the truck again, and that guy's fighting with that guy because the Doppler thing was wrong. And like, it's not that interesting to me, but I do like the storms. And uh, like, I looked it up because I have I'm I have I'm very macabre, and it's like four out of the six of them or something are dead now. So that I kind of- Oh, wow. Oh like, my God. Two of them died in a in an actual storm, in an actual tornado. And then one of, I don't know what the other <laughs> ended up doing, but yeah. That to me is fascinating, which probably says a lot about me, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I like having a something on in the background as like a comfort thing um while I'm writing but it's usually like plot notes like I have a different thing when I'm plotting or like writing up by hand than if I'm actually like trying to get something drafted or edited then I can't have any distractions so I, I think though maybe if I was going for a noble one I have this book right next to me so I was thinking about it. so if I was going for like a noble family to fight that I would just really enjoy taking down it would be the bad guys in Mexican Gothic oh. yeah. I just, ugh, ugh, they're so creepy and I hate them and I would love to uh, really no. I still would I've only like a couple take down the frail in. old man Oh yeah! <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. No, I have a couple no, chapters no, in, and no I totally get what you're talking about. Mm. They're so wild. It just it right just off gets the bat. worse. Oh man, mm -hmm. the old racist man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have already walked down. It's like a 20 minute walk, and I'm ticked off because they made me do exercise, and I walked to Owen's books, and it wasn't there. <gasps> like, it's one of the most popular books I see everywhere. It's Why do you think it's not there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, maybe. That's so good. Did, oh, did you hear that it got um, picked up as a, it's going to be a, like a mini series? Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. Read it. Um, and Griswold says, I want to fight with Sabrina, Chilling Adventure. Mm -hmm. I haven't landed on anyone to fight to the death yet. Uh, yeah, Sabrina would be super. <laughs> I, although I feel like having watched that show enough that she would like really screw something up and potentially <laughs> killed and then be like oh i'm learning a lesson from this <laughs> I'm well, i was gonna say it'd be interesting to have her fight sabrina the teenage witch sabrina of like oh. the original tv show one or the archie comic if you want to get weird but just to see what happens interesting. <laughs> let's just see Ooh, if i was gonna okay if i was gonna fight someone that i don't love as much as i love jason 
but someone who I still feel like is very very weak. I would fight Clary from the beginning of the Mortal Instruments oh, series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, she's like, annoying and she's weak. So. Let it, again, let me do that. Red hair, I can just yeah, infiltrate yeah. seamlessly. No one will ever know. No one has to know. <laughs> yeah, so you that's, have I'm so dumb name. at I'm the beginning of that series. Changing you, my answer to Clary. Rachel, Rachel has uh, Cassandra Clare's blessing, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was mean, like, when we were at the signing, I was like, what is happening right now? Because Cassandra Clare like pulled her aside and was like, yo, you look like my idea of like what I saw in my head when I was yeah. with Larry. And I was like, what is even happening right now? So yeah. I just like, passing out. I, yeah, I freaked out a little. Yeah, that's like one of the first times that Aaron and I like went, like, I think we had, we had like met and we had like hung out a couple times. That was like one of the first like things we ever did together is we went to Cassandra Clare signing. Yeah, and then after we got our book side, she's like, oh, you look like how Clary looks in my head. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so excited. I just make that your bio. Like, hyperventilating to Aaron. Yeah, on your business that would card. definitely be my Twitter bio. <laughs> <laughs> I also had very long hair at the time, so did not look like this. But I yeah, mean, you could look like that, but with long hair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Place her and you're you're good to go you're i would i would too i'd do better than she did mm -hmm. you even have all the tattoos now that look like the what's right. the thing's called yeah exactly <laughs> and even that, like even easier all... to infiltrate mm -hmm. <laughs> this yeah. doesn't seem like a bad idea <laughs> and because like one of the things that makes her so annoying to me at least initially was like how much she was like so threatened by all of the other women like oh she's so gorgeous it's the worst or whatever and i was like just calm down like honestly, I felt like there was some shaming and like, yeah, yeah. It was it's been so long since I read the beginning of that series that I could not tell you what happened. But yeah, she wasn't really cool until like book three. Yeah, I just remember <laughs> thinking that, and then having someone else say that, and me being like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I read her in high school, and high school me thought she was pretty damn cool. I was like, wow, look at this artsy girl, just like getting in and yeah. fighting. <laughs> High school dreams. <laughs> um, Vanessa says, I want to fight with Hermione Granger. Yeah, that Granger. That would be. That's for my ego. Hermione Granger. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good Halloween costume. Oh, <laughs> we can't talk about any of the real characters anymore. So <laughs> exactly. <off> brand characters. <laughs> Um, yeah, she would be good to have in a fight. For sure. Um, hello to Nicole, here with a new username. Fancy, fancy. <laughs> I love this comment. I would always write with headphones or in a separate room. Stephen King did this, but eventually got tired of missing out on things in his family's life, so he would... So he would set his office in the living room. He also did a lot of cocaine, so I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Why is your writing crutch slash uh, yeah, the, depend on? The word words do not endorse drug usage. Oh, <laughs> that is your writing ritual. Please keep it to yourself. Uh, <laughs> Stephen King did do a lot of cocaine, and well, that's one of my favorite um, like stories about him is that he can't even remember writing Cujo. That's like a fun fact I always throw out. I, I think that it was one of his good books. And then later he's like, oh yeah, I can't remember writing that. I was like, oh, that explains <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh dear. And Griswold said, book rec, I finished The Year of the Witching last week and enjoyed every bit of it. Gave it four stars. Didn't love it as much as Mexican Gothic, but if you're looking for something to read, I am. And that is on my list. So it, I will yeah. open it up. On my list too. Good to hear that it was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, y'all! I sent. I uh, sent. Wow. What am I even talking about? Um, I just finished reading um, a book called Seven Devils, which is by Elizabeth May, who I love, and Laura Lim, and it's like this really cool sci-fi. And I gave it five stars. And to me, that is like top tier, top shelf. Very difficult. Exclusive club is Rachel's five star reading list. So if you want like a really neat sci fi with like a good one of those good found families and like a evil empire that's trying to rule the galaxy and that kind of thing, highly recommend. <laughs> uh, so so we did say all questions in this Q and A, and we have a question from Jesus Christ. <laughs> Who would like to know if we have? Oh, totally. Uh, <laughs> Can you confirm that? Uh, yes. <laughs> 
Wow, what a Sunday we're having. I know, <laughs> truly. Man, I didn't know we would get such big names at this. Point. I knew wow. that we had wow. 10,000. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for coming to meet us. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> um, Ellie asked uh, if anyone else has a good rec, especially YA fantasy. I need something to kick me out of my reading slump, and romance books aren't fixing it. I'm currently listening to a song of Wraiths and Ruin, and it's really good so far. I'm not super far in, but it's really good so far. I just started that like two days ago. Really? My yeah. whole just came through at the library. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. oh, what else have I read recently? Like, I haven't read any like fantasy in a few months. Ooh, I just finished reading uh, Forest of Souls by Lori Lee. Ooh, that that really was good. a really good one. It's like an Asian folklore inspired fantasy with um, people who are shamans and can control mm -hmm. elements and souls and like light and dark. And mm -hmm. they have like animal spirit familiars. Uh, and there's also like dragons in it, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I really enjoyed that. There's like a creepy enchanted forest, which like... Nice. Gotta love me some creepy yes. enchanted forests and like mm -hmm. black magic uh, relating to souls. It's it was really interesting. I I really liked it, so I'd recommend that one. I um I feel like this is very mainstream, but I am rereading Wicked Saints. Uh, mm -hmm. and then the second one is supposed to be really good too. But I mean, you've probably read that because I feel like everybody has. Um, yeah. yeah, I also I was just looking through my list. Uh, the Merciful Crow was like a really fun, unique. It had like classic YA fantasy tropes in it that felt really like, oh, this is familiar. It just feels YA fantasy, but then it had this really cool and unique world to it. Um, they also had vultures, <laughs> just like Wicked Saints. Yeah. So I, actually ju I just finished reading The Faithless Hawk, which is the sequel, and it is so good. Like that is one of the best fantasy duologies I've read in a really long time. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Um, what did we say? We had a question. Oh, um, a recommendation for the Animorph series. I did not get to read that as a kid, and I feel a little ripped off because I mm -hmm. feel like uh, everyone has read it. I always see it going around because I never read it either, but people talk about how great the last book in that series was and how they it's like the darkest portrayal of war and the actual consequences mm -hmm. of war. And yeah, like it's a middle grade series. So, huh. Um, I also hear about Goosebumps all the time, and, and again, it's not a series I was allowed to read as a child, so just another thing I feel really ripped off about. R.L. Stein has like YA books coming out right now, like mm -hmm. in the present day. I haven't read any of them, but <laughs> loved Goosebumps. I haven't read, yeah, I haven't read any of his young adult stuff, but I did grow up reading Goosebumps. I have about 30 of them, I think, and I'm slowly starting to introduce Charlie to them. But mm -hmm. she's not quite there for the scary mm -hmm. stuff yet. So we'll they see. were too scary for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like when I was working at the bookstore and you have those like middle grades, so, like you know, nine or ten year old kids come in, be like, I want something scary. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> what uh like what do you like to read? And they're like, I like goosebumps. I'm like, okay, so like what about this like kind of cool fantasy thing? And they're like, No, I want scary. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Small, terrifying like, small child. Like, like all right. Deadly portraits of Brian E. Gray. Which is one that I always like, do. Like, <laughs> like, on your own way. <laughs> it's, it's buried behind me somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that on the scary. twenty copies of which is fashion room. <laughs> <laughs> that one's like that one is um, scary-ish, but not like horrifying. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, it was like my uh, my friends like oh my kid read which is bash and ruin and it was re it really scared her and i'm like how old is your kid she's at 12. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh -uh. it's not for That's you not for child. child oh my goodness <laughs> it is at least pg-13 do yeah. not give it to your 12 year old the scary series i read as a kid it was actually it's by michael grant but he co-wrote it with k.a applegate who's his wife who is the author of animorphs and it's the Remnant series, and it was the creepiest stuff, like like people's eyeballs melting out of their faces and oh. weird demonic babies because they like travel wow. to some other planet in like a stasis pods and stuff, but they all like malfunction, so like people were getting eaten alive by worms and like what? it was like it was pretty grotesque, and it that was, was wild. all middle grade. 
<laughs> was this a, it was a middle grade? Oh, I couldn't even get away with exploding someone's head and they're making melting eyeballs. Rude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get lectured, author. They let to do cool things. I get lectured by like my editor if I try to like make anything too scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dark. Um, <laughs> hello to a bunch of new people that just joined us. I'm so <laughs> sorry you joined us this a weird time. time. This whole chat has been a weird time. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ask not gonna get right. <laughs> a little melting eyeballs between um, friends. <laughs> and Griswold is, said, I'm reading The Devouring Grey and OMG, the aesthetic is everything I want in a small town with a deadly forest. I'm only 25% in, but I'm here for it. I just finished The Deck of Omens a couple yeah. weeks ago. The second book is real good. Oh, yeah. It's good. The aesthetic is yeah. so strong. It's so good. Cool thing. Yeah. And the relationships well, between the characters I really liked as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the characters... Um, and the aesthetic of the vibe of the whole thing was just so good. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the audiobook has extremely creepy singing for Ooh. the like founder song. Because um, they have the, the audiobook narrator sings it and then they like pile on her voice a bunch of times. So it sounds like a choir. <laughs> it oh, was wow. so creepy. <laughs> wow. I noticed something that uh, Christine Lynn Herman does really well is like these really cinematic sequences that you can like really picture in your head. So if you're looking for a book like that, that is absolutely the one you should read. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good book. Um, Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas comes out a week from this Tuesday and it is very good. Uh, everyone should read that. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I if can't wait to start getting into those spooky fall vibes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also have Winston Churchill in the comments who would like to know the where whereabouts. Jesus. Wow. <laughs> the whereabouts he was Jesus. just here. <laughs> just yeah, we just saw him. him. Maybe he'll be back in a few days. Three days. <laughs> oh wow. Oh dear. This is devolving. Um, <laughs> As Emma's like, I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stick around. Subscribe if you like books and publishing and much more orderly chats than this one. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> not it normally is. <laughs> Usually we don't wear all the same shirt and we aren't Which, like honestly I'm thinking we should rethink. <laughs> <laughs> Redheads or gingers. <laughs> what do we think of redheads or gingers? Rachel, get out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but Megan can stay. <laughs> we approve of them. Like <laughs> we have two. Uh, you know, I just came here to have a good time, and I'm feeling so attacked right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a relevant question from N. Griswold. <laughs> Um, reminder, if you're joining us, we're talking about books and writing and publishing, theoretically. Um, so, and Griswold said, question, when I start querying in the new year, hold me accountable. I will remember that and I will hold you accountable. <laughs> um, should I skip my top choice and start in the middle of the list of people I want to query or start with my number one dream agent? I mean, go hmm. big or go home. Like, the, what, the worst they can say is no. That's true. I, mean, I think that's, that's I guess, my... I guess the concern attack. is what if you sent it to some other agents and got some feedback that things mm. needed to be fixed and so you could make it better before you sent it to the dream agent? Mm. Not saying that's the right answer, but that's probably, I'm guessing that's the line of thinking here. Yeah. What I personally do, I've queried, uh, I've queried more than one book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at this point and I tend to I usually have like three or four where I'm like I think we would really mesh well with this one and so I'll send to like one of them and then I'll send to uh, like seven to ten agents and then if I start to get like really strong responses like a lot of full requests then maybe I'll shoot out a couple more to dream agents um, but if it's a lot of crickets I'll kind of hold off for a bit just to see because i it's pretty likely that if it doesn't go well, that I'll want to revisit the query and the book itself. And so I don't want to send it off to everyone who I think would be a 100% good fit. And that's yeah. just me personally. <laughs> that's, that's what I did too. Um, I did like a tier system uh, where I pick like 
like I'm not sending to anyone that I would not love to be represented by, but I had like four in the top category and then middle and bottom. And then I would just send to one or two in each column. Um, and sort of, I would always definitely reserve like my top dream agent for like a second round if, to hope, hope that I get some feedback. Um, but keep in mind, like your dream agent might not be your dream agent, if that makes sense. Like my, my agent is my dream agent now, but I didn't really, she wasn't on my list for a long time until I stumbled across her because she's in the UK. So it was never like something mm -hmm. I was zoning on so and you then you ha you had an offer from someone who you thought was one of your dream agents yeah, that's the ironic yeah. thing mm -hmm. is that she was she was like the in the top tier and I had an offer from her and I, we got on the phone and I just didn't click with her um so that's always something to consider that your dream agent might not actually be your dream agent somebody could look really really good on twitter or have a lot of sales and you two just don't click when you get you know to talk to them or you don't have the same um, idea for your book. Like they see it editing it one way or selling it one way. And you're like, no, that's not what I want at all. So. Yeah. And honestly, a huge thing that uh, you don't really think about when you're gearing up to query is that your list, um, a huge amount of it probably won't be accepting submissions right when you're ready to go. Like my list, I've had to keep an eye on because at least 50% of them have been closed at some point during the year. And so I always choose my way based on like who is open right now because they do open and close a lot to help manage their inboxes and give enough time to their actual clients and stuff. I definitely have a lot to think about. So my attack plan was to kind of like go big or go home because I also have plans to start like digging into the query trenches like probably about February, March of next year. But I think that I'm definitely going to reconsider now. <laughs> like it well, makes a lot of sense because like you think about it and you're like in your head, you want it to go so much faster than it really actually does. Publishing goes very, very slow. So it does make sense to kind of send out to a small pool of people. And then it, like you said, Megan, if you get a lot of requests, reach out a little bit more and kind of like poke some of your more, you know, agents that you want to work with. But definitely research, research, research every single one that you send. You can, I was just going to say, you can usually tell um, if you should like get back on your email and send out 10 more immediately. Because um, you'll look at your like statistics, be like, oh, I sent out five queries and I've got four requests, full requests. And then you can be like, okay, I'm going to go immediately send 10 more. Um, cause those are really good statistics. Or you can also see if you're overall across the board getting form rejections, it's a good, you know, indication that maybe you should hold off a bit and see what comes back. And if you might need to tweak your query type of thing or the, yeah. Start, which is yeah. Um, one thing Ellie pointed out too, was I've noticed a lot of agents and editors, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've noticed a lot of agents and editors move agencies and publishers as well. Yeah. That's super common. I've had a couple agents, um, who are on my list who have like switched and that always throws a wrench in timing of things. Um. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <sighs> Fair question from Sam Baker about where to buy my books. Um, if you're in Australia, uh, you can do um, what's it called? Book depository, right? Where they ship yep. for free anywhere. Mm -hmm. They'll have them on there. I don't I think that's the easiest because um, it's published in uh, the States, Canada, Turkey, and Russia so far. And that's it. So. <laughs> Interesting market. That's it. She uh, says, it's it's a big list of countries. Yeah. I just had an email from someone from Turkey that was like, it was translated, and they're like, I read Bryony Gray and I loved it. And I'm like, this is cool. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> it seems really random, but it's really, really cool to get readers in Turkey. You're like, didn't think I would connect with someone from there. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Chris Walt said, thank you for the insight. I value your opinion so much. Erin has made me feel less stressed about rejection from the dream agent. Rejection from a dream agent is a rite of passage. Like, honestly, oh, yeah. it sucks. But also, it's like, oh, 
I was in front of that agent or their email reader <laughs> for 35 seconds. Like. Keep in mind too, that um, they will remember you. Weirdly enough, um, I remember, you know, like, querying my second and third novel and them being like, oh yeah, uh, I remember your name from when you queried we, me with Emmeline Black and me being like, oh wow. Like, um, so even though they do read a lot, um, it's possible to make an impression and have them like remember you for the next book and request it because of that. Um, or even reject a book that you've sent them and be like, send me anything else in the future. Um, so even if you get a rejection from a dream agent that doesn't like slam the door shut on you, mm -hmm. um, it opens more doors sometimes. For so. sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got a great video coming sometime next year that does the life cycle of one of Aaron's books that <laughs> doors will shut on it so many times and it's about to be on shelves. <laughs> the very long life cycle, the long, painful life cycle. <laughs> <sighs> uh, uh, yeah, let us know if there's anything writing, book, or publishing related you want us to chat about. Otherwise, we'll just keep doing our thing yeah we're definitely <laughs> happy to talk about querying um let's see we do have a question do you write with the intent of turning your books ideas into scripts eventually i am way too lazy for book writing so all of my book <laughs> ideas go into script format unless they are shorts or graphics um Ooh. kelly and i were considering this i know that desiree isn't here right now but she's also interested in script writing I have not actually ever written a script yet. I don't know, Kelly, have you tried to start one? Nope, I feel like I don't know where to start of like, I don't know how to write a script and I don't know how to learn to write a script. I know. Megan's, Megan's got books though. I'm on it. Of course, Megan has books. Screenplay by Sid Fields. <laughs> the foundations of screenwriting. I feel like, what would be really nice would be to like write a book that gets like optioned for the screen and then like get to work with Can like an experienced that. writer to like write it with yeah. them or something like write the screenplay with them so you like learn how yeah, like firsthand somebody I think like B.E. Schwab is doing something similar to that right now like yeah, I know I that she's so. been posting a lot about either working with somebody or actually writing the pilot for mm -hmm. one of her books too so that was yeah. kind of really cool to watch her she's progress with like a writing room or something isn't she mm -hmm. i think she uh, mentioned something about that which would be so intensely cool mm -hmm. to me dialogue is one of the things that i spend the most time tweaking like it's one of the things that i am re revising for the longest and so the idea of like doing a whole script sounds harder to me than writing yeah. a whole book mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's I, also you have to think of so many things because if, if you're doing a script, you also have to add like screen directions and mm -hmm. like things for the prop department to do and like give an idea of like a setting, but in like two sentences or less. And I feel like that's just, yeah. I would not be able to do that. Cause- What I've been mm -hmm. tempted to try, cause it's so hard to like, I don't want to like put any of the ideas I've been really mulling on into a script. Cause I know my first script is not going to be anything I'm ever going to do anything with. So I kind of wanted to like take one of my favorite book series and turn it into a script on not something I wrote. Love my sister. I would love to see this in a movie. Yeah. I can't do anything with this. It's not mine, but it's a good way to like have fun with it in a story I really know, but also That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Be excited about it still. So I yeah. Think, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's such a learning curve, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a whole well, especially when you take books into consideration because it's like when you write books you're supposed to leave a little bit up to the reader's imagination and you're supposed to give them the material but they're supposed to envision the actual scene in their head whereas when it's come to script writing you're in charge of every single facial emotion like of mm -hmm. that actor of that character so it's like i feel like most of like my rough drafts start with dialogue it's all dialogue mm -hmm. but my my thing would be okay what is this person doing when they're saying this dialogue? How do I convey yeah. that in a way that this, you know, this, you know, this actor or this, you know, producer is going to read it and actually know what direction to give? Like, That's what's kind of hanging out. It is left up to the, I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. But I think uh, more than we think is probably left up to the actor and their interpretation of the character. Like, I don't know. Director. Well. Yeah. yeah as somebody who did theater for a while and got numerous scripts yeah it's like you there's only so much that you can do with a script um 
but then the yeah, it's mostly I say the director and of course the actor because we all get together and like go over our characters and like what right. we feel like you know we're gonna be and stuff changes so much throughout like the like the process of putting on a play and like learning your lines and stuff. So it is right. interesting to see like how different people direct the same character. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but, it is yeah. sort of like everything's sort of up to interpretation like within right. guidelines. It's very odd. Yeah. And you have someone that's like, oh, play the character like this versus like play them more like this. And as as a writer, you're like excuse me like I write a character one way and that's how they are mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's like a really like a mindset shift that I don't mm -hmm. know I could do without like a lot of work yeah and well it, like, especially if you wrote now. yeah especially if you wrote a character in a book and then it got turned into a movie or whatever and you're looking and you're like but that's not the way that my character would act or whatever but it's like this is the way this person interprets this character and you're like no <laughs> I think like I think for me, I would be like, obviously, if someone's like, hey, we want to make a book or a movie out of your book, I'd be like, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would want to be super involved if they were going to change it a lot. I don't think I would want to be like that. Mm -hmm. The was like hovering over things. Yeah, I think I'd like to go on set and meet everyone mm -hmm. and maybe like be in the background, you know, like Julie Murphy was in Dumplin' and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, I personally don't feel the need to be super involved were I privileged enough to have my books move into that format because it just that's not a format I know I'm not going to do the yeah. best job on it yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. like I would, I would only want to be involved for the experience of mm -hmm. learning yeah. to like write scripts and things, exactly but not it. because I feel the need to have control because yeah I don't know like as a reader like I very much it's something I've had to learn as I've gotten older of course but like I'm pretty good at like letting go of like oh something has to be just like the book it was based on it needs to be good sometimes it's just not good but um but like I'm okay with things being a different interpretation of a story and so I think it would actually be kind of fun to see how someone else interprets my story and how they retell yeah. it yeah yeah and I would basically sacrifice one of my story babies for the chance to be in that process so <laughs> to be on set no. and just watch it unfold like yeah I don't mm -hmm. need to have my hand in the pot of saying no this needs to work this way I just want to be able to watch it unfold in front of me like the idea of being on any set at all let alone something that's you know an interpretation of something that I've written is like my dream I just want to visit us that one day like I just yeah. want to watch everything happen Plus, it's like a movie, even if it's like super different from your book, like a movie or a TV show always brings more readers to the book. So, yeah. uh, Troll does bring up a compelling point of if someone wants to give me half a million dollars for my half baked Scorsese knockoff of a screenplay, I wouldn't complain. And I mean, yeah, I'll never say never. Like, if someone wants to give me some money to write a screenplay, like, oh, definitely. I'll yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. me up for that. I'll learn how, but just know that I'm learning. Like, and I, <laughs> that's the thing. I don't think that like, if I had a VE Schwab situation where they were like, here, let's throw lots of money at you. Fine. I will learn how to write a script. Until <laughs> that happens. <laughs> my leg, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that I would invest a huge amount of time into it at this point. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I have books I want to write though. Those are just the all of us. Our medium is books right now. So yeah. <laughs> but that's what I enjoy too. Like I've, looking at the format of a script I'm like this does not draw me in like I'm not like excited about the idea of writing this unless I could see it like produced and come to life then for sure I almost think I, I would rather write a script for something completely different not based on one of my books mm -hmm. you know because like if I've already written it as a book and envisioned it as a book I feel like it would be harder to write it a different way yeah I will say from a writing advice standpoint I do think it's really beneficial to read the screenplays of things that you love. I think there's a lot to learn there um, from like a storytelling as a whole standpoint. Um, screenplays are really good for learning structure. Yeah, structure, mm -hmm. dialogue. Um, it's all great, big recommend. I don't think that I would be like a JK Rowling. Like she had to like, cause by the time they started doing movies, she was like big enough that she could be like, okay, it has to be like this and it has to be like that. So I don't think I would be like that, but I also wouldn't be like a Cassie Clare where like, I'm so removed that they can put like a big plot hole into it. I hope. <laughs> oh, it God. But like, then you can say, oh, well, I had nothing to do with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you can That's remove true. yourself from it. Like I know Stephen mm -hmm. King does that a lot. Like he purposefully That's isn't right. involved in a lot of stuff. Cause like, I believe like he he has admitted to not liking any like 
cinematic adaptation of anything. Roy Orden, who like, do not speak to me of the movie. So we will <laughs> not speak of that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, we I think also, it'd be like more more than like supervising every aspect. It would just be more important to me, like in the very beginning, to know that the people handling it are people who like get the story. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's most important in, in an adaptation is just getting like the heart of the story and like the point of it. And then like you can change parts of the plot and the characters as needed because the format is very different. Like putting a 400 page book into a two hour movie is never going to be exactly the same. And I don't mm -hmm. want it to be like, it's boring honestly, when it's like shot for shot, like exactly the same, same dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, but just like knowing it's people who like get what you are trying to do and what and what type of story you're trying to tell. And realistically, mm -hmm. most authors involved don't have any say. Yeah. <laughs> No. If you're not a J.K. Rowling or a Rick Ward, and I don't think you really are going to have a big say in it, most likely. Mm -hmm. Unless mm -hmm. you have your rights and you're the one selling the rights, then you have yeah. a say in who gets them in the first place. But True, that, but most of us are not going to turn down the offer. Yeah, most exactly. of us don't have multiple offers on the table. <laughs> yeah. I think um, all the time about this one guy I knew who was a lawyer and we were talking about how I write books and he did not understand why I wouldn't just shop my book ideas around to movie producers, oh, just God. send them, sell the rights for a month and then take them back and sell them to a new producer. <laughs> like, what? Oh, Get on it. That's an option? Yeah, <laughs> and maybe I'll also practice law while I'm at it. <laughs> like, Those are bizarre. Technically, you you sell like Barney Gray sold shopping options at one point. It was for three months. And then you do have the option of they buy the rights or you, um, you could sell it to someone else. But yeah, you can't do that without a film agent. You can't just be like, hey, what up? Producer? I have this idea. <laughs> Surely you want to buy it. <laughs> it's not written yet, but let me tell you. Yeah, no. It's going to be the greatest American novel that you've ever read. You're not going to yeah. get escorted out by security. You won't even make it through the front door. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. You have a question by Ellie M. Any word nerd collab books in the future? I like this question. <laughs> One can help. <laughs> um, we are kind of like in each other's business, um, so to speak. We have like a writing group uh, that meets all the time. So like when you read my books, there is almost always like word nerd influence in them. Um, the biggest one will be when Emline Black, which is now called um, uh, Escape to Witch City. That's the new title. When that comes out, Ooh. it's like, I feel like it's like 80% word nerd. Uh, <laughs> Kelly, especially, we had like this giant sit down collab when I flew out to Toronto that was just amazing. And her and I replotted the whole thing together. Um, so like that is like a form of collab. Like I wrote it, but we dreamed it up together, essentially. Um, but as for like an official writing one, I know that we have talked about it. I know that we have daydreamed about it. Um, we have a Google Doc, <laughs> but nothing is done. We do. Um, it would be so big and potentially so messy, but like we dream about it. Like one of my big dreams is like having a writing room and like being somehow mysteriously like inheriting a aunt I don't know her like millions so that I can fly all of you guys out and just like, do a writing <laughs> room together for something. Yeah, um, we can only hope. Someday, maybe. Um, but uh, Megan and our um, uh, our, our, extra, our recurring character, Kyra, have, are collabing on multiple books. Yeah. I will say I love writing. Like, I really love writing. Obviously, we've been doing this for so long. Mm -hmm. um, writing with a co-author is the most fun I've ever had writing. <laughs> um, so Kyra and I have written three books together. And hopefully someday, the not too far future, you'll be able to read one of them. <laughs> Uh, but we'll see. But highly recommend writing with a co-author if you know someone. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to try it. Yes. yes definitely. Um, we definitely have more questions. We have a couple more questions, yeah. Um, Vanessa asked, why would it be messy? Uh, there's just a lot of us uh, yeah. <laughs> revising two authors. Uh, like Kyra and I have been revising for three years <laughs> a book that the two of us pantsed together 
and it has needed all of those years for revision. So it would just require a lot of forethought and then a lot of cleanup yeah. afterwards mm. to get it all organized. Yes. Not I don't, I don't it, mean messy but... like drama or anything. I just mm. meant, yeah, because there's so many of us. Mm. Like Also because we hate each other. But... <laughs> 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 drama. Also because I think all of you are terrible writers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, um, we love each other. There's, there's like, I don't know how we would do POV, like, mm. would there be eight POVs? Like, mm. so we'd like have we have talked about doing like anthologies and I feel like yeah. that's a lot more doable with a group this yeah. size. So mm -hmm. maybe one day. Anthology. Yeah, we shall see. Anthology. But Desiree Over. said we should write a sitcom about the word. Yes. I have legitimately thought about that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> as we mentioned earlier, Desiree is our in-house screenwriter. So, right. <laughs> you so know. maybe Desiree, you should write that about us. <laughs> we'll consult. <laughs> yeah. Let's get a writing room and Desiree can write the script. <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah. Hope you don't mind, Desiree. We just volu volunteered to you for that. Voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we had a question from Sam, a book I almost got published was considered um, too unmarketable by the marketing team, but the editor loved it. Should I rewrite it or try another publisher? <sighs> I think I asked them. What, yeah, like why, why did they not like it? Was it like a genre thing? Was they it said like, it wasn't marketable. But that could mean anything. <laughs> that yeah, could that be like it's just not the right time in the market. Maybe, you know, maybe it would do because yeah. you know, you're running a sci-fi and sci-fi is not big in the market right now, but maybe it'll be big next year. Or is it like a, we don't think we can sell this because it's set in Florida, but if you set it in California, it would be super trendy. Like, you know, it would kind of depend. So I'd listen yeah. to what they had to say about it yeah. and then like decide if maybe you could wait or if it's something that's small enough that you could edit it. Yeah, and definitely. I feel like one publisher saying something is unmarketable isn't enough of a reason to like scrap a project or like completely redo it. Um, but if you're getting consistent feedback that something just isn't marketable even right now, either right now or just in general, then that's when you'd want to consider if there's like something different you could do or if you want to self publish it or what you, what you want to do next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like some of my favorite books are so difficult to pitch to people because they're so strange or they have a really weird genre mash, but they're so good. So I'm sure somebody would enjoy whatever, you know, whatever craziness you like, have going on there. Trying trying to pitch Gideon the Ninth. You're like, how do oh, I God. explain yeah. this book? <laughs> Lesbian necromancers in space. Yeah. It writes itself. <laughs> <laughs> the Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. Gosh. You're like, it's sci-fi, but also fantasy, but also like sort of magic realism, but also alternate history. Also, there's like demons, also like alternate dimensions, <laughs> also like superpowers. And people are like, what? What? And I'm like, I swear it's really good. <laughs> and that, that editor being like, I have to write the back copy now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Glasses of wine. <laughs> yeah. I would say definitely send it to some more people. If it's like a broad marketing problem, rewriting it isn't necessarily going to fix marketability from like a business standpoint but marketability could mean so many things like they could have another title that's too similar so they think yours isn't marketable enough they could have recently published something that didn't do as well and so now they are scared of doing that thing like business scared not like actually frightened but uh mm -hmm. hesitant to do that thing um and that different publishing houses will have different experiences with that it's not a guarantee that every um, person you send your book to is going to feel the exact same way but yeah Especially like Emma said, the editor liked it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. like you already have somebody on your team and they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna help you find somebody that's that's best to sell it through yeah and uh if it doesn't go anywhere definitely keep that editor in mind again for the next project because they will remember that they loved your book before and they will be looking out for you I can pretty much guarantee it mm -hmm. Um, we have another question about agents somewhere. Uh, Lottie, Lottie. Made, uh, oh yeah, about the dream agent question. If you get a full request from another agent, should you send it to your dream agent immediately after that, just in case this other agent offers representation? And then goes on to say, it seems so much to depend on time. If you receive an offer, I've heard you shouldn't then send out another query to someone else. I don't know if this was answered already. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So definitely once you have an offer, it's 
considered a little shady to like, oh, I have an offer. Let me blast out queries so I can immediately tell them I have an offer. Like they'll definitely yeah. see through that and know that that's what you're doing. So right. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> um, I don't want to sound pessimistic because a full request is an amazing, amazing thing. It's something to be so excited about. It shows that you are like so close to the thing that you want. But at the same time, like agents request a lot of full. So I wouldn't take one full request as a sign that I need to blast my book out to everyone. Um, Aaron did mention earlier, if you send to five and four request a full, then I would maybe you know send it out to the people I really, really want to have it. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's just one, I would wait and see. <laughs> Yeah, you get some agents who will just like, there's not many of them, but I know thinking of one in particular, which is like always request a full. <laughs> um, so it's rarer, but um, yeah, I wouldn't take it as a sign to like send immediately to your dream agent. To your entire list or something. Yeah, or your entire list. Yeah, because especially if you um, get feedback from that full and they're like, can you change this and this and this? And then you're going, oh crap, I wish I'd you know known this before I sent it to my dream agent you know um so it's always good to take that into account and be like maybe you're going to want to edit it based on feedback so mm -hmm. yeah but a full request is still an amazing thing and if yeah. you have it you should be so hyped Proud. just <laughs> play the numbers game to see like if you're getting a lot of requests then it's worth sending it out to more um it's not necessarily even a guarantee that you'll hear back on the full like I know I've had back when I was querying my last book that I queried, I had fulls that were out for like ages. Like after I got an agent, I would get like full rejections back. Um, so definitely just keep track of the dates. And if you don't hear anything back within like, if they have a time on their website, go by that time. But if it's been like six weeks and you're not hearing anything back, then I would just start sending to a new wave anyway. It's all very complicated and it takes such a long time. <laughs> And like, if you do somehow just get one full request and you get an offer from that person, um, like someone, either Megan or Aaron said this, um, like you shouldn't be querying anyone who like you wouldn't want to work with potentially. Um, but also if you do get a request from one person and you talk to them and you're just like not feeling it and you really have other people that you would rather query, you don't have to accept like just because it it's feel like you have to, yeah. but really don't. Yeah, yeah. Just because it's the only the only offer you get does not mean that you have to accept it. Yeah, yeah. like, like basically up until you sign a contract, like you don't owe anyone anything. Yeah, <laughs> even if you even if you thought they were a great agent and you talk to them on the phone and you're like, no, I'm just not clicking with you, or um, like I always recommend um, that you talk to their clients in advance. And not just their happy clients who have sold six books already, but their clients who maybe haven't sold anything yet. Um, and it can sometimes be hard to do that. You have to figure out what's the polite way of doing that. But I was actually able to talk on the phone to these clients because you cannot tell tone of voice by email. You can tell tone of voice on the phone. And it's great to be able to hear them say, yeah, I'm pretty happy with her and then have a tone to their voice. Right. And you're like, maybe you're not. Um, so it's, it's great to kind of feel that out if you can. And then if you're realizing, oh, I think I made a mistake querying them. It is nothing to be ashamed about. If you say, I just don't think we're a great fit. Um, thanks. Thanks anyways. Um, Cause a bad agent or an agent that just doesn't work with your style of communication or your style of editing is, is I promise you worse than no agent at all. Uh, they will waste your time and they will frustrate you. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Also, Sam said in the comments that her book is a sci-fi fantasy mishmash. Um, yeah, yes, please. Like, that sounds great. I don't think that's unmarkable at all. Yeah, um, definitely try some more because that might be a no for one house, but there are definitely others out there that would consider it. Yeah, yeah. I can think of some very popular sci-fi fantasy mashes. Yeah, like you can make it work. Something like that, right? Yeah. Like, the idea is to just like fake it or whatever, like pitch it as one or the other. Um, and, you know, you might get like a, a marketing team that's like, well, we don't want to do that or we can't do that. And you could very well find a marketing team that's like, sure, we can do that. We'll just pitch mm -hmm. it as 
Right. Especially if that feedback was, hey, this isn't marketable right now. And it's not, hey, this is a pile of garbage. Like they gave you good <laughs> feedback, right? Like <laughs> they're just saying, hey, we just can't sell this necessarily right now. But that is one house's opinion. Yeah. So it's like, hey, I you have something that piqued the interest of an editor at a publishing house. I definitely feel like maybe like read a little bit more into like the feedback that they gave you, but don't completely scrap it altogether. Because mm. I mean, like Rachel said, like it's something that's out there right now and it's very big out there right now. Yeah. yeah. Bone season, Prince of Thorns, Saga, yeah. even getting the ninth to a degree of like, well, you know, there's a ton adult, of stuff. I don't know. Did they say adult or YA? They didn't. Okay. No. Um, it, this might not apply then, but I know if you're trying to sell a YA that leans heavier towards sci-fi, it's hard. It's a hard market right now. It's a hard market for fantasy too. It's a hard market for YA in general. Um, so that could be a factor. Um, and then you might want to look into, but again, like think about it before you do like maybe query it or sub it to other editors, other publishers, see what feedback you get. But like, you might have to lean more towards uh fantasy maybe in revisions eventually. Um, it all depends what the market does. So. I think it's just querying and like subbing your book is a lot, but also I hope that people watching don't feel like too discouraged and like, like we're all doing that or have been there. And like, I don't know, you just keep going and like every rejection feels like a rite of passage. Like I said earlier, like it's like, oh, that hurts, but it means I'm here, which is a place that I wanted to be a few years ago or whatever, you know? It means progress. Yeah, it means you're making progress. Um, it means you're one no closer to getting your yes, or it means you're one no, no closer to um, fixing the book into what it's supposed to be or finding the new idea that's going to be the one. Like there are so many different steps and just, I hope that I hope that we get to see everyone's books on shelves someday, like all of the people who are in the comments and stuff. It really, really like the more I'm in the industry, the more I'm realizing like, yes, some of it's talent, but like 90% of it, I feel like is just being so impossibly stubborn that you refuse to give up in the face of like rejection and like bad sales and flop titles and like, you're just like, no, screw all of this. I'm going to keep writing. I'm going to write my next book. Maybe it, it will be this one that takes off. No, it didn't take off. Maybe it'll be the next one. Um, so just having that kind of attitude, I feel like is the only way that works. <laughs> yeah. Don't be discouraged. Be stubborn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <sighs> well, we've been going a little over an hour. So. Have, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to wrap it up with any more thoughts. We had a pretty good discussion about publishing and querying and if anyone has any more they want to add. Yeah, by LEM said, why fantasy is very hard to sell right now with a saturated market. Yes, I keep hearing that from Fact. everybody, from agents. That sucks to hear <laughs> as, as somebody who is writing and trying to sell why fantasy. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are on sub right now, don't be discouraged because literally everybody I know is saying um, the wait times right now are astronomical. Like they're usually really long, but right now because of COVID and because of agents working at home and trying to balance family life and agenting and maybe looking, trying to homeschool their kids, like the wait times for, for sometimes querying and especially for sub are like intensely long and it's really hard to sell something right now in general. Um, and that will change. Um, it always changes. The market is constantly fluctuating. Uh, like one of the reasons I think Witches of Action Ruins pulled as fast as it did was because witches were becoming like a, a big deal. We are still at a point where I think they're a big deal, but it won't last for very much longer. So don't don't take that as I should go out and write a witch Start book. writing a witch book now. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, Unless you've already had the idea, in which case do it. Which yeah. have always been around. Yeah, I, I don't think it's something that's going to die out ever entirely either, because it's such a giant subject, right? Like I'm always going to. Yeah, that, so. I don't think I don't think witch books are going anywhere. Not going anywhere, but like right now they're having a boom, and like, that will uh, like fizzle out a little bit at some point. Because I know there's a few. It always like if you look at stuff like a while ago. Stranger Things comps were like all of the rage because mm -hmm. everyone was talking about Stranger Things. And then Sabrina came out and everyone was like, oh my God, witches. And then we had like a relaunch of the craft or so, well, I can't remember what it was. 
Um, so yeah, and they've got another season of Sabrina coming out. So witches are going to have like a little bit more. Um, but, but yeah, keeping track of market trends is interesting to me, but I don't necessarily think always super helpful because um, publishing has such a delay on it. But yeah, hopefully we haven't discouraged people. <laughs> you can do it. You can. We're doing it. <laughs> if we can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Everyone is doing their best. We're just That's all I can ask hard. for right now. Yes. And finding wow. other writers to, to vent with and to take the journey with is super important. So that's why we're here. We're here for you guys. And thank you so much for tuning in and for asking all of these amazing questions. It was a great discussion. And we will see you next Sunday. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye.